Ah, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Um, I'm very glad to tell you today about our joint work with seven other great co-authors coming from different institutions and companies displayed here on the slide. So Yope, Craig, Leo, Ilya, Michael, Anans, and Douglas. And among them, the folks from Google, which are Anans and Ilya, are present here at the conference, so feel free to ask them questions. My name is Valeria, I'm a PhD student at Stanford. And in this talk, I'm going to tell you how can we build um, a quantum secure key exchange for TLS. So we will focus here on protecting currently deployed and widely used cryptography against quantum computers. So let's look at the main crypto primitives that are used in TLS. So this is public key cryptography, uh, key agreement and signatures, and for that we use RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and elliptic curve-based analogs. Then symmetric key cryptography like IES-128, and hash functions like SHA-256, SHA-3. Um, unfortunately, quantum computers can break currently used public key crypto, meaning there are efficient quantum algorithms that can break RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and the family. So the public key algorithms will need to be replaced. And in fact, NIST is calling for proposals currently. Symmetric primitives will need larger keys, and hash functions will need lo longer outputs, and that's because of better quantum brute force attacks. But we know that quantum computers cannot provide an exponential speed-ups for search algorithms, thus there is no reason to believe that we will need to replace symmetric encryption or hash functions, and that's why all effort needs to concentrate on deploying new public key crypto. So let's see how these primitives are used in TLS. So let me quickly go over the protocol. So the first part is the handshake that helps two parties to establish a shared symmetric key case such that any eavesdropper who is listening on the channel will have no information about the established key. So the client initiates the connection by sending a client hello message. The server replies with a certificate chain and server's key exchange message. Then the client sends his portion of the key exchange and they finish the handshake. And at this point, both the server and the client from two key exchange messages compute a symmetric shared key K and then they encrypt the rest of the traffic using this key and some symmetric cipher like IS. Um, so the first part is where the server authenticates itself to the client. And currently, we don't worry about protecting this part against quantum attacks just yet, and that's because certainly quantum computers will be able to impersonate the server in the future when they break uh, digital signatures, but this will not compromise the authenticity of today's connections. Okay, the second part is where the server and the client agree on the key, so key agreement. And the third part is where the traffic is encrypted using symmetric encryption. So to protect this part, uh, we just need to double the size of the key, but the protocol we use for the middle part, the key agreement, can currently be broken on a quantum computer, meaning that there are efficient quantum algorithms that can recover the symmetric shared key and then decrypt the rest of the traffic. So we'll need a replacement here. And here is a very important point. Um, so if someone records these communications today and gets a quantum computer in the future, then they'll be able to go back and break into the connections that we do today. And that's why we need to start moving towards quantum secure crypto protocols now to protect our today's communications, perhaps most valuable of them, from being decrypted by a quantum computer in the future. So this is the motivation, and in this work we propose a new quantum secure key agreement alg algorithm. But first you may ask me, why should we care? Uh, when to expect a quantum computer or will it ever be built? Of course, it's a highly debatable question still, but certainly there was a tremendous progress over the last decade um, and physicists are working hard. So just let me throw a few facts at you. One of the most successful groups is coming from the University of Santa Barbara and is supported by Google, and they predict a quantum computer capable of breaking today's keys in 15 years from today, and they have a concrete timeline that they hope will get them there. Uh, the head of Microsoft Research recently said that uh, quantum computing is one of the largest areas of the investment. Uh, well, Intel invests as well. Um, IBM made its small, pu uh, small quantum computer publicly available, so you can access it over the internet and run um, computations of your choice. Perhaps the most interesting facts are coming from NSA. So from revelations of Edward Snowden, we learned that NSA is building a quantum computer and a year ago, NSA put a message on their website urging us to move towards quantum secure crypto and encouraging research in this direction. And they even prioritized this over moving to elliptic curve-based crypto. 
So these two facts coming from NSA might be somewhat worrisome. So overall, you see there's a growing effort and a lot, a lot of investment. So we probably need to prepare a quantum secure alternatives for our crypto, keeping in mind that standardization of these new protocols will likely uh, take a long time. So let me now explain you our proposal for new quantum secure key exchange. So the most studied cryptography assumption that is considered so far to be secure against quantum attacks is the lattice-based assumption called uh, learning with errors, LWE. So this assumption is very easy to explain, so bear with me. Essentially, it states that it's hard to find solutions to linear systems in the presence of noise. So let me explain it in pictures. If I give you a square matrix A and the vector A times X, then it's easy to find X. You just apply a school method like Gaussian elimination and you get X. But now if I add some noise vector E to it, uh, whose coefficients are small, compared to the coefficients of the matrix, then it becomes hard to find x. And it's not even hard to find x given the matrix A and this vector. It's even hard to tell whether the vector that I gave you was constructed this way or whether it was picked completely and uniformly at random. And this is it, this is the assumption. So for random matrix A and random small uh, vectors x and e, given the matrix, it's hard to distinguish A times x plus e from a random vector. And this assumption is due to Regev. So why this assumption? So first of all, um, it was studied for about 20 years um, extensively and is considered now to be one of the best candidates for being quantumly secure. ILDB assumption has a very nice property. It, uh, it's called worst case to average case reductions. And what it means is that if there is an adversary that can break the assumption uh, for a random matrix A with good probability, then we can use this adversary to break the assumption for any matrix. So essentially what it means is that we don't need to worry about hard or easy matrices, we can just pick a matrix for our key exchange at random and we would be good. This is not the case for factoring or discrete logs where you need to be really careful when you pick your primes, your finite groups or your elliptic curves. And that's why they're put into standards. Okay, um, also this assumption is very different from the two assumptions that we, oops. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Maybe, let me recall. Oh, so it seems to work. Okay. It works? I think so. Oh, no. It... Oh, the switch to. Sure. Oh, I see. Okay, fine. Okay, good. Um, sorry about that. So, <clears throat> the third point I want to make about this assumption is that. It's very different from the two assumptions that we use today, which are hardness of factoring and hardness of finding discrete logarithms. So potentially this assumption could be like a third leg for our crypto to stand on. And additionally, although we don't talk about it in the paper, but you may have heard that lattice-based assumptions give, um, this assumption gives a very rich set of other crypto primitives like fully homomorphic encryption, attribute-based encryption, and even obfuscation. Um, so, there is a related assumption called ring LWE. It is, uh, it recently got a lot of attention, so I want to say a few words about it. Essentially, um, it's the same type of assumption as general LWE. But matrices there that they use here are not uniformly random, but they have some additional structure, namely, each row of the matrix is a cyclic shift of the row above it. And uh, these matrices were specifically introduced um, to allow for more efficient protocols in terms of communication and computation. And pretty much all prior work was considering this problem for deployment. Um, but in this work, we show that the original LWE problem is suitable for deployment and is comparable. So just to name a few prior works, 
Lindner and Pikert gave first construction for lattice-based key exchange. Then Dean et al. gave a blueprint of the key agreement. Pikert later improved it. Then BCNS paper implemented the protocol. They've chosen concrete parameters and they integrated the protocol into OpenSSL. Then New Hope paper improved the implementation. And recently, Google uh, introduced the New Hope Cypher suits into the ver test version of Chrome, Chrome Canary. So again, the ring LWE problem use matrices with additional structure. In contrast, LWE matrices have no additional structure. And uh, they're chosen uniformly at random. Although currently there is no reason to believe that ring LWE can be broken on a quantum computer, essentially the same algorithms uh, for ring LWE, uh, the best algorithms for ring LWE are essentially the same as for the general problem. Um, but recently, a security gap was discovered between structured and unstructured lattices used here. In particular, one problem called ideal SVP turned out to be easy um, in structured lattices, specifically because of their original, uh, specifically because of, of this additional structure. Although this result doesn't break the key agreement protocols, um, it calls into question the exact security of assumptions over um, structured lattices. Sorry, the pointer somehow doesn't immediately work. Um, so we all know that rings might be dangerous and we should be very careful when using them. Uh, perhaps we should even uh, seek for alternatives uh, to have them around in case the rings are destroyed. And we built such an alternative in this work, namely we get rid of rings. So let me briefly remind you how Diffie-Hellman handshake works as the LW handshake will be very similar and I want to put them side by side. So in the Diffie-Hellman uh, key agreement, the server will pick a random X and send G to the um, X over to the client. Then the client will choose a random Y and G send G to the Y back to the server. And then they both will compute G to the X, Y and use this as for their shared key. And the Diffie-Hellman assumption in this case states that given G, G to the X, G to the Y, um, this is what the eavesdropper sees on the channel, you can't distinguish G to the X, Y from random. In other words, the adversary can only get the shared key by random guess. So LWE is very similar, except instead of raising G to powers, we'll be multiplying matrix A by vectors. So the server will pick random small vector X and small vector E and send A times X plus E to the client. So the server will be multiplying the matrix on the right. The client will choose a random vector y and the noise e prime and do multiplication on another side, on the left. So the server, after receiving client's message, will do a multiplication by his secret x on the right and get something that's close to y times a times x. And same for the client. So both parties have now approximately agreed on the key. They can sort of discard the less significant bits where the, uh, the noise is and take the most significant bits and take this um, as their shared key. But since we're working modulo Q, we will do something a little more sophisticated here than just taking the most significant bits. Namely, we'll use a reconciliation algorithm first introduced by PyCard and generalized in this work. But I'm not gonna describe it here because I don't have enough time, but it's pretty simple so you can ask me during the break. Um, so the LWE assumption in this case will have the following form. So given the matrix A and two messages of the handshake, we can only get a shared key by random guess and no better than that. And this assumption is reducible to LWE and certainly you can find the security proof in the paper. So this is the handshake that I've, you've just seen. I just want to reemphasize a few important points here. So in practice, instead of fixing a matrix A in an EAST standard or elsewhere and having the same matrix for all or multiple key exchanges, we propose generating a fresh matrix A for every key exchange. And this will defend us against pre-computation attacks and also will make sure, will ensure that the matrix is not backdoored. So since the matrix is rather big, instead of sending it over the network, we propose generating from a seed using pseudorandom generator. So the server will send the seed to the client first place and then they both will um, derive the matrix from the seed. So for security, we will rely, rely on the hardness of LWE and the security of PRG. The secrets uh, and the noise will be coming from a distribution that will be a parameter in our system and it will be an approximation to a discrete Gaussian. 
And XY secrets will not be single vectors, they rather will be multiple vectors concatenated in a matrix. So you may think of applying LWE problems multiple times here. And this is done to have enough material at the end uh, so that the parties could derive a shared key that is long enough, like 256 bits. So the most important question when designing real-world crypto system, especially it's true for lattices, is how do we choose parameters? So our key agreement is parameterized by four numbers, uh, the modulus, it is the power of two, and all operations are done modulo q. Uh, the dimension n, so our matrix A is n by n, square matrix. The noise deviation, our distributions are approximations to Gaussians, and the number of extracted bits. And uh, the more bits we extract, um, we take as the most significant bits, the higher is the probability for the parties to arrive at different keys. So this number defines the failure probability for the protocol. So for a protocol, it will be not zero, not zero uh, but it can be made as small as you wish. So we searched this parameter space um, in order to minimize the bandwidth and to satisfy the following two conditions. So first of all, available classical and quantum attacks should be run in t time that's more than 2 to the 128 um, to account for the state of the art in crypto analysis. And the probability of failure due to the surrounding should be small, smaller than 2 to the uh, minus 32, which we picked as a conservative enough bound, I hope. So here are the parameters that we arrived at. So the left set of parameters are the parameters we recommend if the described system is going to be deployed in the real world. It gives 130 bits of security against known quantum attacks. Paranoid set of parameters reaches the complexity lower bound for sieving algorithms, meaning that any sieving algorithm on this parameter set will take time at least 2 to the 138. So you may see that the modulus here is 2 to the 15, which conveniently fits into the two bytes integer. The number of bits that we extract is four out of 15, and the communication both ways for recommended is 23 kilobytes and for paranoid it's 26. So a few more words I want to say about the noise distributions. How exactly do we approximate Gaussians? Um, so by et al. showed how to substitute the Gaussian with another distribution in the lattice-based proofs using erroneous divergence as a measure of security loss. Then New Hope paper used it to substitute Gaussian for binomial, which is a lot more efficient and easier to sample from. And they now work through search scripts we found optimal distributions that minimize the need divergence, enhance the security loss, and require fewer random bits to draw a sample. And we represent these distributions with lookup tables. So here is an example. This is a recommended distribution for the recommended parameter set, approximating a Gaussian. It needs only 12 random bits to draw a sample and needs to look through the table of just 14 bytes. So we wrote a constant time implementation for our handshake in pure C. The implementation is based on the Oculus project that Douglas, one of the authors, is working on. The Oculus project aggregates the existing quantum resistant implementations, enables their comparisons and um, prototyping. We benchmarked our protocol against RSA, ECDG, and all available implementations for quantum resistant protocols. We integrated the protocol into the OpenSSL where we edit new cipher suits, such as the ones that do pure LW handshake and the ones that combine LW handshake with diffie hellman And I'll explain why this makes sense in just a second. But before that, let's uh, look at the standalone performance for our protocol. So it is highlighted in red. So again, we compare it against RSA ECDHE, which are the most widely used algorithms for handshakes on the internet today. And then we compare against state-of-the-art and lattice-based implementations, which are New Hope and Entrum. Um, and against two other alternatives that are available, Azagenis, SIDH, uh, which is a quantum secure alternative to Divi Hellman, and Michaelis, which is a code-based uh, key exchange. So you see that SIDH is too slow to be competitive and Michaelis generates too much traffic um, and you may notice somewhat different security levels. So uh, let's concentrate on what's important. Since ECDHE is taking lead today, we compare ourselves primarily against it. So you may see that our further protocol is two times slower and takes uh, five, uh, about, yeah, a lot more traffic than ECDHE. Um, so while you're staring at this table, I want to emphasize 
here that the purpose of this work was not to build a faster key agreement, but to build a more secure one. And I want to remind you that both New Hope and Entro crypto systems are using, are using structured lattices that might be weaker in contrast the fraud protocol built upon a well-established problem over general lattices. So um, we also find it instructive to show these numbers just to complete the picture, but also this work demonstrates quite surprisingly that the key agreement from general problem, from general LWE is very competitive. And you see that it takes milliseconds and the traffic is just tens of kilobytes. Um, it's important to recognize that for the next few years of deployment of new cipher suits, they are likely going to be used in hybrid modes. So we should suggest uh, using both post-quantum key agreement protocol in conjunction with the traditional key agreement protocol like ECDHE. So we can, for example, pair up ECDHE and New Hope, as was done by Google in their experiment, or we can pair up Frodo and ECDHE. So then, in order to break the protocol, the adversary will need to break both problems separately. So, in other words, you may think of uh, using post-quantum part to prevent future quantum attacks and using traditional part traditional part to prevent uh, classical attacks against post-quantum. Um, and of course, for hybrid cipher suits, the difference between lattice-based protocols becomes uh, less pronounced. So perhaps standalone numbers do not reflect the actual cost of switching the cipher suits, as there are many other things that usually crop in in real world. So what number really matters is how many more servers will you need to buy in order to serve traffic with these new protocols. And in order to understand that, we need to look at the throughput. This is the number of connections per second. So we ran an experimental server that under heavy load measured throughput with different protocol protocols varying the size of the served payload data from one byte to 100 kilobytes. And you can see the results here. So we compare three lattice cipher suits, New Hope, Enter, and Frodo, all in hybrid modes, so combined with ECDHE and ECDHE itself. So you can see when serving very small pages, the difference between Frodo and New Hope is about 1.5. And not surprisingly, this number drops when we increase the size of the payload. So it's already 1.2 for 100 kilobyte payloads. And same for ACDHE, so uh, drops from 1.6 to 1.4. So I'm ready to wrap up. To summarize, we've built a key agreement protocol for general lattices. We implemented it, <laughs> integrated it into the OpenSSL. We extensively benchmarked it, and you can find many more numbers in the paper. We've generalized um, Bikert's rounding approach so we can now extract more bits for the key, thus saving the traffic. We've developed new methods for noise sampling that will likely be useful in other lattice-based implementations. Uh, we've wrote scripts to search for concrete parameters, and we've made all the code, including the scripts, available on GitHub, so the first repo you can find standalone implementations and search scripts, and in the Open Quantum Safe project, you can find the, uh, everything integrated into OpenSSL. And our final contribution is that uh, Froda took off the ring. So thank you very much. Hugo Kravchik, um, this is great work, so. Um, uh, one comment is that uh, if we are going to use these uh, uh, techniques now, uh, it should be used only for information that should be uh, st stay secret for 20 years, right. because otherwise there's no reason to do this. Right. And if it has to be secret for 20 years, you need to think about uh, lattice parameters that will be secure in 20 years. And I don't think that uh, the numbers that your work or recent works really take into account where we are going to be in cryptanalysis of lattices. I'm, I'm still assuming that quantum computers will not break lattices, mm -hmm. but other advances in cryptanalysis probably in 20 years. So and that's something that I think we, you need to, you and everyone working in this area need to consider. And then I have a question about, you say hybrid, uh, classical, and 
I mean, lattice-based and classical, what, what, what's the combination of the things? The hybrid cipher suits? Yeah. Uh, so we, the combination there is use the lattice-based uh, key agreement together with Divi Hellman. So you do both in parallel, and then you derive your session key from two keys. Right, so to recover the session key, you'll need to break into both problems separately. So you'll need to break Diffie-Hellman separately and lattice-based key So that, that, that's not TLS. I mean, once you do that, that's, that's not TLS. I mean, it's a different protocol. No, it's still TLS. I mean... Um, but TLS doesn't let you do that. You don't do this sequentially. You just combine, you know, in your server key exchange message and in your client key exchange message, you just combine the two. So it doesn't introduce any more rounds, so it doesn't change the structure of the protocol. Yeah, I mean, it's a different tier list, but... Uh... <laughs> okay, hello, Mark of Corbus from Microsoft Research. So um, I have a question, it's more like a subtle pool of security point, and maybe there's something in the paper that, is, uh, that kind of stands on that. So typically for, for elliptic curves, the assumption that you prove TLS on there is not purely a uh, decisional for Hellman, but it's something that allows for some kind of Oracle access, um, um, so it's ODH, and I suspect that there's something similar happening in, in the lattice world, and I, I was wondering whether you thought about that. So you're saying that... Uh, so it's, it's about active attacks, but the, it's active attacks that are possible even if the signatures are secure in the present. So it's kind of, if, if you want to be secure against kind of active, active attacks, um, then you, the assumptions are not, it wouldn't be learning with error, it would be something else, and I don't quite know what kind of assumption it would even be. I see, so we didn't quite look at the active attacks, I guess, but, but to, the only thing that we did is we, our implementation is constant time, so there are no side channels. Um, but yeah, we would be interested to, to know more about the elliptic curves. I think Douglas, Douglas would probably kind of um, have thought more about it, but it's maybe not the focus of this work. I see, yeah. okay. Any more questions? If not, then ask this one. Um, Tim van der Kamp, uh, University of Center. On slide 22, you had this uh, graph where you show where if you have more payload, then there's a difference. But ah. in TLS, you just exchange the key, right? So the payload is always the same, or am I missing something? Uh, you mean the graph for throughput, the number of connections per second? No, so uh, depending on how much things you have to encrypt, I guess. Um, it, so can you go to slide 22? Uh, yeah, here? Yes, so? indeed. So depending on the payload, you have different throughput in the Right, But yeah. you just use uh, symmetric key cryptography for the... For the, for the payload, right, right. Um, but that means, so that was what's happening in real world servers. Like uh, if you're serving large traffic, other things start to crop in into your key exchanges. And um, you know, I, I mean, we are not concentrated here on just separate servers that only do handshakes. The servers are doing, uh, serving the, the whole thing, the, the whole protocol, right? Including the symmetric part. Okay, so depending on, yes, okay, I see. Okay, thanks. Right. <laughs>